everybody, this is Shivani Patel. I am an Applications Engineer with Go Engineer. In this webinar, we're going to go over four common simulation errors that I've seen over the past couple years that I've been working with simulation. Now the first one is a pretty straightforward one. This is the mesh failed error. This can happen when you have parts that are interfering with each other or parts that have very small edges, faces, curves, that type of thing. Let's see it in action. So in this model, as we run the simulation, we get that pop-up for the mesh failed. If I run the mesh itself, I get a little bit more of the detailed response telling me which parts failed. In this case, uh, the most common reason a mesh might fail is an interference. So you check an interference by going to the Evaluate tab, Interference Detection, you hit Calculate, and figure out what's interfering here. If something's intended to interfere with each other, like in a press fit example, we do have shrink fit contacts, but we're not going to get into that here. Instead, we're going to assume it happened because of small faces and those edges. And when that happens, we can tell which parts didn't mesh with which ones are red here. What we have to do then is apply a mesh specifically to those part files. So the way that I like to do it I'll grab both, I right click, and I say create mesh. And what this is essentially doing is creating a mesh control on those particular bodies. And we'll see those drop down into here. So I put a finer mesh on those and it was able to get around some of the smaller geometry and actually mesh those parts. So those are the best ways to really fix a mesh failure. Uh, let's go back and look at the next error. So this one is model is unstable. This is a very, very common issue with a lot of different reasons it could happen. Most of the time it's due to fixtures or messed up contact sets. So this model is unstable error, what I'm going to do is kind of go through the ones that SOLIDWORKS recommends and then go through a few things that I do as well. So starting with this file which has the model instability, I'm going to go ahead and run it and look at that error. Okay, so when I don't know why it's happening, the first thing I do is try and give myself a little bit of visual feedback. So the first thing I do is I have the customer or I go through myself and I start hovering over the different contact sets to try and just see what has been applied to the different parts. Now, maybe I can't tell what's missing from just hovering over it. So the next thing that I do is I look at the contact viz plot. This was new in the more recent versions of SOLIDWORKS. I calculate, and it's showing me every single contact set, including the global contacts, for the entire model. Now this is a simple part, and right away I can tell that these two parts are missing a contact. There's no bond between them. This cover's going to fly off as we apply force to it. So that's the issue here. But let's say I didn't realize that. Well, what are my next options? Well, starting in 2016, I can right-click and go to Find Under Constrained Bodies. And what this does is run a very, very simple static analysis. You see how quick this runs compared to the actual one, which tells me which bodies don't have enough restraints and in which directions they aren't constrained. So I can tell that this one's not constrained in all three directions. Now, if all those possibilities just don't work for you, here are a couple of the older methods. Uh, first, I would go into the part file itself. I'd go to Properties, and I would hit Use Soft Spring to Stabilize Model. What this means is a bunch of springs all around the part file, very soft, invisible, and they just help hold it together and help with the stability. So I'll turn that on. I'm going to run this now. I am going to get that pop-up. Uh, this was one of the third pop-ups I talked about, the excessive displacements. Do I need to turn on large displacement error? So when this shows up, there's two major options you need to focus on. Click yes or click no to solve a large or small displacement. Really what you want to ask yourself is, do I intend for the part to move a lot? If you did, then you need to hit yes. If you didn't, hit no. And this part, I don't intend it to move a lot. It's happening on accident. So I'm going to click no. And then I get my solution. It was able to solve because of the soft springs. 
then what I usually do, I go over to the displacement type. I see which components are bright red, and that tells me that those are the ones missing the restraints. And in the extreme scenarios where soft springs also fails to work, I do this the slow and steady way. And that's you go into your tree and you exclude everything from the analysis. Right click, exclude from analysis. And then you run. And you're really just checking this out one part at a time. Okay, this one works. Let me go here, include the next one, and see how this runs. And you keep doing that over and over until you find the component that causes the instability, and then you know, okay, I need to go in and add contact sets for this particular part file. So for the next error, do we want to turn on large displacements? We kind of saw that pop up a minute ago with the soft springs. I'm going to get a little bit more in-depth with it as we talk about what large displacement is and the nonlinear versions of it. So let's take a look at this part file here. In this component, I applied a advanced fixture that forced it to rotate by a large amount of degrees. If we look at the deformation scale, it's on deformation scale of 1, so this is actually the amount of distance this part is trying to rotate. So it's moving a large amount. That's why when we were running it, I had to turn on large displacement. I'm going to go ahead and turn it off and rerun it so you can see what this looks like. There's that pop-up again. But this time I do intend for it to run for large displacement, so I'm going to hit yes. Now what this is doing is splitting it up into particular amounts of steps. And what it's going to try and do is carve it up into time steps as the part is moving piece by piece. Now what static can do, as it's running these different time steps, it can update the direction that the load is being applied. So if you applied a normal force onto a face, it can understand that the face is moving and keep changing the direction of the force. What it can't do is understand that the stiffness of the part is changing, and it cannot change the amount of steps the large displacement is trying to run. If there's too much displacement or too much collision, static will probably fail with an unstable error and you won't be able to get any further without going into nonlinear. Now just to clarify, uh, small displacement and large displacement, we're not talking about elastic and inelastic here. What large displacement counts is based on the relative size of the model. It's going to look at the maximum displacement over the characteristic length and make sure it's less than 10% to count it as a small displacement static study. So we're going to look at the last error here. This is a solution failure in step greater than 1. It's very common in a nonlinear solution to see this, but if you're newer to SOLIDWORKS, this might be something you haven't seen before, but it's very common as you get into nonlinear. So these two pop-ups I have here have the same beginning paragraph. It's pretty generic. And then it gets into three different ways to fix it. The first is raise the convergence tolerance slightly. The second is reduce the singularity elimination factor, or for plasticity models, raise ETAN, that value. So I'll go through the ones that SOLIDWORKS asked for first, but then I'll get into the troubleshooting that I normally do. All right, in this one, let's start with what SOLIDWORKS described. They started with that convergence tolerance. That's in our advanced options in the nonlinear study. You can see that number here. When people see this number, they usually ask me, hey, does this mean stress of 20 PSI plus or minus 0 0.001? No, absolutely not. This convergence tolerance is something that the solver is doing in the background as converging on particular elements, particular solutions. This has nothing to do with the final result in physical value. You do want to be careful about making this too large, obviously, because that will reduce the accuracy overall. Same thing with that singularity elimination factor. So by default, it's set to 1, and that warning said to try 0 0.5 or 0. A singularity is when you get a very high amount of stress on a very small portion of the model. It can happen, say, if you have a chamfer and that chamfer is colliding with another component, you could have a high level of stress on that edge. Or if a part is bending by a great amount, at that internal corner or internal edge, you could get a high level of stress. And that's what we call a, string, a singularity. 
So by lowering this singularity elimination factor, you're going to reduce the accuracy in those high stress regions, but you may help the solver to complete. So that's the pro and con there of that one. The last thing that the warning mentioned was to change the material, and this was only possible if you had a plasticity type. So you go to that tangent modulus, you're basically messing around with the material factors, and we don't really want to do that because that's fake. You're faking the data again. So here's what I usually do to try and help the nonlinear to solve. The first thing I do is I go into properties and I change the time increment. So these are the default numbers, but if you lower these, you can increase the amount of time steps happening in that region where the solver is failing. And by decreasing that, there's more likelihood that it will be able to actually finish the calculation, be more stable in that, in that region of time. So this is the first thing you should always try. Uh, the second thing that I usually do after this step is to change the mesh controls. So the parts that are getting the higher stress, I go to those, I apply the mesh control on those faces, and I bump it up pretty fine to get a higher level of quality in that region. And the thing I do after that is I start changing the materials. Oftentimes in nonlinear people are using custom materials, so I'll jump them back to the standard SOLIDWORKS materials. So first thing I'll do is I'll try the strongest steel that I have. And if that's not working, I'll also go into rubber. It's really depending on the motion. And I'll try this natural rubber. It has a huge amount of motion. And so if it's failing because of a singularity, usually the natural rub rubber will allow it to complete. And then you know that the reason it's failing is because of lack of material data. And after trying all of those, if it's still not working, what I'll do is move over into a dynamic study. So this is a nonlinear type dynamic. And I'll put in a damping factor. This is something that you don't want to just be making up. Usually these values are extracted from experimental data. But damping can help if you don't have enough restraints on the model. It can help with stability. Uh, the last quick thing I want to mention is simplification. I've got a video here of a swage tool. Now these are usually round. But what we've done in the nonlinear study is simplify it to 2D to make it solve much faster and prevent that rotation factor that could be making it unstable. So the way you would do something like this, in your model you just go to the drop down choice new study and you hit this use 2D simplification option and it's available in most of the studies. So all you have to do is hit that use 2D simplification, you hit OK and then you choose which plane the part file is symmetric around. So this part is axis symmetric, I would pick that, choose the front plane, or a plane to be cut through, and then choose an axis for the center of the part. Now this part file doesn't have an axis, so just quick advice, if you don't know how to do it, you go to reference geometry, you go to axis, and hit the part file. And that's how you can create an axis in the center of your part. So that finishes up those four major errors inside of simulation and the troubleshooting that I like to do. If you have any specific questions that this webinar wasn't able to cover, please contact us at our tech support line or go to our knowledge base at kb.goengineer.com to see all the other webinars and videos that we have available. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.